Okay, we're going to start the review again. <laughs> so here's the first question, and Sully's going to answer it. On August 28, 1776, after their retreat from Long Island, where were General Washington the Continental Army Corps? Sully? Brooklyn Heights with their backs to the East River. Brooklyn Heights with their backs to the East River is the perfect answer. Okay? Brian, number two, who did General Washington turn to for assistance in getting his soldiers horses and supplies across the East River during their retreat to Manhattan Island. John Glover. John Glover. Colonel John Glover. Yep. Colonel John Glover would be best. And C O L period would be great. Colonel John Glover. Okay. Emily, my dear, what two things did General Washington order his men to do that would deceive the British to think that they were still camped during the retreat across the East River. Ten campfires, arrow, empty barrel, Very good, yeah, that's exactly right. Ten to the campfires and to roll empty barrels back and forth to make the British think they were digging trenches. Perfect answer. May? Give the three examples, I only want you to give the first one though, give the three examples in order of how Mother Nature assisted General Washington during his retreat across the East River to Manhattan. So the first thing will be five. What was the first assistance Mother Nature gave? Southern winds caused British ships to not be able to sail. Into? Into the East River. Right. Southwest, a southern wind prevented British ships from sailing into the East River. Okay. McKenna, what's the next thing that happened? Very good, I like that. There was no overcast and it was not just dark, it was super dark. Mm -hmm. super so the British could not see them. Very good. And and at least what was the third one in order? Uh, heavy fog set in. <laughs> which heavy fog set in, which made it difficult for men to see each other from a distance of twenty feet. Okay? Okay, so the third example is the dense fog came in which made it difficult for soldiers to see each other within twenty feet. Perfect. Okay, Alexa, my dear, how did Benedict Arnold save the revolution for the Continental Army on Lake Champlain? It's a little bit difficult. More, I'm a little bit more. Well, what's he want? What'd you put? Okay, that's pretty close. What did you have, McKenna? Okay, so put yours two together. It's perfect. So say you your, say yours first. You first. Yeah. Arnold found a naval blockage in the bridge from getting Washington and his men. Okay. Okay, just a second. So Arnold planned a naval blockade to keep the British from getting to Washington and his men, who were located at White Plains, New York, before winter setting. There you go. Okay? Does that make sense? Do you want the one to Yeah, we should because that's real. Yeah. So he Enacted a naval, naval blockade to keep the British from getting to Washington and his army at White Plains in the OK, White Plains, until winter set in. Perfect. That was a little different question, but that's why we're doing this today. Hey, Rachel, my dear, by the time General Washington <laughs> retreated across New Jersey and entered Pennsylvania, how many soldiers remained with the Continental Army? 2,400, that's exactly right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Andrew, what British general was put in charge of keeping an eye on American forces during the December of 1776 and later showed up too late with reinforcements at Trenton? Uh, Let me read that again. What British general was put in charge of keeping an eye on the American forces during December of 1776 and later showed up too late with reinforcements at Trenton? Charles Cornwallis. Charles Cornwallis is right. Yep. Now he was in charge, but then he used the chain of command, so to speak, or he delegated to the next question, Charles, which is what Hessian officer was stationed at Trenton, New Jersey, with the force of 1,400 men to watch the movements of the Continental Army on orders of the British general? Johann Rall. Johann Rall. And he was a? Hessian. But what was his position? His rank? General. No. Colonel, Colonel, C-O-L period. 
Colonel. Hey, Julie, what British spy provided General Washington with valuable information allowing him the opportunity to win a decisive victory over the Hessian forces at Trenton? John Honeyman. John Honeyman. Does he hold the rank? No. So John Honeyman's spy. Very good, Julie. Josh, in the late afternoon on what day did General Washington initiate his surprise attack on Trenton? Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Yep. Hey, Peyton, give me one of the three pronged movements by General Washington during his advance to Trenton across the Delaware River. Just one of them. Um, the majority of the Continental Army crossed directly from him. And how many was that? Um, 2,400. 2,400, led by Washington, crossed the Delaware River directly across from camp. Hey, Ryland, what about the next movement? Uh, Senator and Benny Cross directly to Trenton. And what kind of men? Uh, were they militia or army or military? Militia. No, they weren't militia. No, no, 700 no. more members of the Continental Army crossed the Delaware River where? Uh, directly from Trenton. Directly across from Trenton. Very good. Okay, Brian, the third problem. That's exactly right. Yeah, 1,500 militia men crossed under. Doesn't matter what order you have, man. The 2,400 under the command of Washington crossed the Delaware directly across from their camp. 700 more colonial army crossed directly across from Trenton, the Delaware River, and 1,500 militia crossed farther downstream. Okay. Very good. Andy. What two options did General Washington ponder once, in, once he and his troops crossed the Delaware River and prepared for the assault on Trenton, knowing the other two prongs of the attack failed to cross the river? What were his two options? He said retreat or go big or go home. I like that. Retreat or go big or go home. Let's just make it easy, okay? Which one did he choose, Peyton? Um, to go big or go home. There you go. So put in there, retreat or go big or go home. Yeah! That's a good one. Okay, Alexa, my dear. What trouble did Washington run into shortly after he and his troops crossed the Delaware River? Very good. A loyalist spy witnessed them crossing the river. Perfect. Okay. McKenna, what huge mistake did the Hessian colonel, in case you have trouble with colonel there, make regarding the trouble General Washington ran into as mentioned in question 19 above? Okay, he didn't read a written note given to him about Washington's advance. That's a good answer. He didn't read the note. What did he do with it? We should probably say that. Put it in, put it in his pocket. He, he put the note, I would say the, the colonel put an important note about Washington's advance in his pocket and never read it. Okay, there you go. Julie, my dear, during the Battle of Boundbrook, what town in Connecticut was under siege when the British were looking for supplies and ammunition? I think it's Danbury. Danbury. Now, I, want to, I think I confused you on that because the Battle of Boundbrook was the battle that happened at Danbury when they burnt, you know, burnt the town up and looked for ammunition. The Battle of Richfield was the battle that came afterwards when Sybil Ludington, etc., went and got the militia and they drove them out of Connecticut. That is the difference, okay? All right, um, Sully, who was the heroine who saved the day? During the Battle of Boundbrook, because her historical ride in New York, because of her historical ride in New York, rounding up militia for her father. Sybil Ludington. Sybil Ludington. Okay. Elise, explain what a military musket's like as far as accuracy. What you know, give a description of, of the accuracy. That's what I'm looking for of a military musket. Um, it has a interior of the barrel, so it bounces along around a lot. It, it what was it? <coughs> The bullet. The bullet. The bullet. Actually, it's a mini ball. Well, go ahead. Mini ball. And it wasn't very accurate. Because it came out of the barrel. If you watch the video, it came out of the barrel like what? Baseball. <laughs> I don't know. You know what a knuckleball is? Yeah. A knuckleball, and, and I can throw a pretty good one. I'll show you some But a knuckleball is a ball that a pitcher throws in baseball that's really slow. But the way you throw it, it moves. And it's very hard to hit. Sometimes major league hitters are used to hitting really fast fastballs or curveballs. 
can't hit a knuckleball because it comes, it's just weird, it just moves, it drops and everything else. Well, that's what the, he was saying is, the, what Lisa's saying is it does have a smooth barrel in which the, the bullet, we'll say bullet, although it was a musket ball, the bullet comes down the barrel erratically or bounces around and it comes out of the barrel like a knuckleball and is not very accurate. So, you know, we don't have to write this in your answer, but it's shot in group volleys. They're hoping to hit something, no, not necessarily what they're aiming at. Okay, very good. Now, may, tell me what a Kentucky long rifle was made of. So, Kentucky long rifle had a longer barrel and the inside of the barrel was grooved. Very good. So when the ball came through it rotated right. instead of bouncing around causing it to when it came out it like went very, very more accurate. accurate. That's good. Yep, that's very good. Doesn't that doesn't the video kind of help you with some of this? I mean I think it really does. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um Rachel, I'll be answering the first question. Here. Who is the Patriots most famous sniper in the Revolutionary War? Timothy Murphy. Timothy Murphy. Who is his target at Saratoga, Emily? General Simon. Very good. General Simon Fraser. And Andrew, what was the end result? Uh, Other than he killed him. Oh. He, he killed the general and forced the British to, not right away, retreat. Okay, they didn't surrender until later. So the third thing is he killed the general, forcing the British to retreat. Okay? Now, I'm going to make a point here as we go. The reason I give you these reviews is I want you to know exactly what the answer is that I'm expecting, and it gives you an opportunity not to have to study everything we talked about. Doesn't that make it easier? Yeah. Okay, than guessing. Okay. Okay. Andy, do I have this on here twice? If I do, I'm going to do so. I do, don't I? Oh, God, thank you. I thought I, I just ran these tests on. I would be so upset. Okay, Andy, who is the British Army's most famous sniper in the Revolutionary War? Patrick Ferguson. What was he? Anybody remember? What? Captain, right? Captain. C A P T, period. Works good. Okay, who was it again? Patrick Ferguson? Okay. Charles, who was his target? Right. And Peyton, what was that end result? Here's what I want you to put, see if you have it. What's the end result? Um, he refuses to shoot George Washington in the back, so they were able to. Okay, he refuses to shoot George Washington in the back, so he his legacy becomes, he becomes, just a second. He refuses to shoot Washington in the back, and his, he will, okay, he refuses to shoot Washington in the back, and his legacy becomes, no, I want to work as part of the, the His legacy was defined by the shot he never took. Okay? So the end result was he wouldn't shoot Washington in the back, and his legacy was defined by the shot he didn't take, or something to that effect. Okay? Perfect. Okay? He would not shoot Washington in the back, and his legacy became the shot he didn't take, or something to that effect. Okay, Ryland. During the brutal winter of 1777-78 at Valley Forge, how many American soldiers were trying to survive? 11,000. 11,000. Exactly right. Okay. Brian, who led the Indian rescue party that saved General Washington's starving troops by bringing 600 bushels of white corn to Valley Forge? Han Yeri. Han Now, you can bet that these guys that are on the ID sheet we're going to want spelled correctly. Okay? And in this particular test, I want first and last names. Okay? First and last name. Josh, who is the man responsible for instilling good discipline into Washington's Continental Army, whipping the troops into a well-oiled professional army at Valley Forge? Baron von Steuben. Baron, Baron von Steuben, yeah. Now we won't worry about Friedrich. Just Baron von Steuben. Okay, very good. All right, Peyton, give me one of the two things France gave Americans of great, okay, just as a result of the Battle of Saratoga, what two things did France give the American cause of great value? What's the first thing they gave? Um, France agreed to recognize the independence of American colonies. Nope, that's a good, I know what you're thinking, but that's not what we got out of the deal. What'd you put for the other one? Uh, to wage war for American freedom. Yeah, you, you, gave the, you gave the definitions of the treaty, which is okay, that's good to know. I should have probably asked those, but I didn't. So Emily, give me one. No, no. What, what did we get out of the deal, babe? We got military supplies and troops. Worth the equivalent of? 13, 13 billion. billion. We received military supplies and equipment 
in the equivalent of today's 13 billion. Make sure you don't make sure you put today's money. Okay. What else we get, Ryland? Uh, Marquise de Lafayette. Perfect. That's all you need. Marquise de Lafayette. That's what else we got. Do, do you don't know put a spunky leader. You could put a spunky leader if you want. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely put her down. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this test? If you know what we talked about today, you will be absolutely on fire tomorrow. The only thing I want to warn you is I want these names spelled correctly. I want first and last names, and I want their position if they're in the military. Okay. Other than that, we should be good to go. Yes, my dear. So we can just put C O L. C O L period. C A P T period. G E N period. Yeah. Do you mean to put General George Washington? Oh, Gen Washington. Okay, test tomorrow. We'll meet in the Commons.